would welcome our friends on Facebook who might be watching, all of uh, our many members of the congregation. Um, it's another hot, it's going to be another hot day. I wonder if we'll have our outdoor service outdoors or if we'll be back inside again. Uh, just a reminder, we do have an ice cream drive through social tonight uh, here in the parking lot from 4 o'clock to 6 o'clock. You can drive by at any time between those hours, 4 and 6, uh, get some ice cream. You can stay in your car. We'll get your order and deliver it to you. You can park and wear a mask and stay 6 feet apart and, you know, so uh, join us for that. We did one in June and, and it was... Uh, Really nice to see people gathering together again, and I think we had a nice crowd, so that's at 4 o'clock, from 4 o'clock to 6 o'clock tonight in the adjacent parking lot. Uh, and for those who do remain home, again, I can bring to you the communion cups that we use for communion. Uh, if you would like to participate with communion from home, I can drop those off. I've dropped a few off so far, so... That's just an option. And next Sunday, I'll be doing communion after the 9.30 service in the parking lot. So about 10.45 to 11.15 if you want to drive by after the 9.30 service next Sunday. So August 2nd, the first Sunday of every month. Uh, we found out from the bishop that there is no synod assembly this year. I know that disappoints many of you. Uh, Thank you for laughing, John. That's, that was, uh, <laughs> it, it, they just can't figure out a way to do synod assembly that, that would be safe and uh, together, 400 people together from the church, pastors and lay people. So they're going to push it off until 2021. We, we, we're, if we were electing a bishop this year, we probably would be forced to try to do something, but we elected a bishop last year. So. Uh, I did get a note from Lisa Haycock that Betty Haycock is, is um, it's not doing well, and her birthday is coming up on August 2nd, so she's asking if you could send a card to Betty uh, for her birthday. Um, she's fallen a couple of times recently and her health is failing, so um, the diagnosis isn't good, and uh, uh, Betty's getting more confused, so probably the sooner the better to send something, but um, she's just asking if you could send her a uh, birthday card, uh, she would appreciate it. And I'm looking around because I didn't save a Trinitarian for myself. Can I borrow yours? I'll give it right back. Uh, okay. Well, thank you. So, birthdays, that's the main thing I needed for. Natalie Moran has a birthday today. How old Natalie would be? Probably four or five, I guess. Uh, Alicia Masico and Caitlin McKenney on the 29th, so that would be the Wednesday. Becky Nye, happy birthday, Becky Nye. I'll get uh, July 30th. Oh, now smile when we say that. There you go. <laughs> Mary Ann Moran. She'll be here for the 9.30 service. It's birthday on the 31st. Denise Null on August 1st. There's Betty Haycock on August 2nd. And Judy Allen also on August 2nd. So any birthdays that we missed in the congregation now? Anniversaries? Pets' birthdays? Yeah, just, I'm just trying to see if you're awake out there. Just. Well, we did add, I added a confession into our worship service that it's missing the confession. So we're going to begin with that. We begin in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. Let us confess our sin in the presence of God and of one another. I ask you can say it quietly to yourself uh, as we go through the confession. Gracious God, have mercy on us. In your compassion, forgive us our sins, known and unknown, things done and left undone. Uphold us by your Spirit, so that we may live and serve you in newness of life, to the honor and glory of your holy name, through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Receive this blessing. Almighty God, have mercy on you. Forgive
forgive you all your sins through our Lord Jesus Christ, strengthen you in all goodness, and by the power of the Holy Spirit, keep you in eternal life. Amen. In our call to worship, I am the Alpha and the Omega, says the Lord God, who is and who was and who is to come, the Almighty. Blessing and honor and glory and might be unto the Lamb. Worthy is Christ, who has ransomed us by his blood from every tribe and tongue and nation, and made his people a kingdom and priests to our God. Holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty, who was and is and is to come. Amen. Let us pray. Almighty God, eternal Lord, we praise you for your love and ask for your continuing favor. Look upon our human need and touch us with your healing hand. Help us to live in peace and prosper us in our honest pursuits. Sustain any who suffer because of their faith and be the physician of the sick and the mighty defense of the destroyed. Uphold your church in every place and give us the will to give of ourselves for the building of your kingdom. Pour upon us a new measure of your spirit that we may rise above our apathy so as to assume greater responsibility for the service of others. Give us, O oh God, comfort and consolation, the zest of life and the courage of faith, until that day when in mercy you call us to be with you forever. Through Jesus Christ, your Son, our Lord. Amen. We'll pray the prayer of the day. Let us pray. Beloved and sovereign God, through the death and resurrection of your Son, you bring us into your kingdom of justice and mercy. By your Spirit, give us your wisdom, that we may treasure the life that comes from Jesus Christ, our Savior and Lord. Amen. Andrea has so graciously offered to read the lessons this morning. The first reading is from 1 Kings, the third chapter. At Gibeon, the Lord appeared to Solomon in a dream by night, and God said, Ask what I should give you. And Solomon said, You have shown great and steadfast love to your servant, my father David, because he walked before you in faithfulness, in righteousness, and in uprightness of heart toward you. And you have kept for him this great and steadfast love and have given him a son to sit on his throne today. And now, O oh Lord my God, you have made your servant king in place of my father David, although I am only a little child. I do not know how to go out or come in, and your servant is in the midst of the people whom you have chosen, a great people, so numerous they cannot be numbered or counted. Give your servant, therefore, an understanding mind to govern your people, able to discern between good and evil. For who can govern this, your great people? It pleased the Lord that Solomon had asked this. God said to him, Because you have asked this, and have not asked for yourself long life or riches, or for the life of your enemies, but have asked for yourself understanding to discern what is right, I now do according to your word. Indeed, I give you a wise and discerning mind. No one like you has been before you, and no one like you shall rise, arise after you. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. The second reading is from Romans, the eighth chapter. The Spirit helps us in our weakness, for we do not know how to pray as we ought but that every spirit intercedes with sighs too deep for words. And God, who searches the heart, knows what is the mind of the spirit, because the spirit intercedes for the saints according to the will of God. We know that all things work together for good for those who love God, who are called according to his purpose. For those whom he foreknew, he also predestined to be conformed to the image of his Son, in order that he might be the firstborn within a large family. And those whom he predestined, he also called. And those whom he called, he also justified. And those whom he justified, he also glorified. What then are we to 
to say about these things. If God is for us, who is against us? He who did not withhold his own son, but gave him up for all of us, will he not with him also give us everything else? Who will bring any charge against God's elect? It is God who justifies, who is to condemn. It is Christ Jesus who died, yes, who was raised, who is at the right hand of God, who indeed intercedes for us. Who will separate us from the love of Christ? Will hardship, or distress, or persecution, or famine, or nakedness, or peril, or sword? As it is written, for your sake we are being killed all day long. We are accounted as sheep to be slaughtered. No, in all these things we are more than conquerors through him who loved us. For I am convinced that neither death, nor life, nor angels, nor rulers, nor things present, nor things to come, nor powers, nor height, nor depth, nor anything else in all creation will be able to separate us from the love of God in Christ Jesus our Lord. The word of the Lord. Thanks, Thanks be to God. God. Proverbs 31, 
uh, one of my favorite proverbs is the uh, uh, a, a woman of noble character is the proverb, right? And part of that is uh, a woman, a wife of noble character, what is she like? Her value is far more than rub rubies, right? So you have this something is like something else, right? You also have teachings that compare the present understanding to future realities. Like in Deuteronomy 28, uh, God says the Israelites will become like an object of ridicule to all the peoples. So Jesus uses the parable that is like the Mashah, it's something that they're familiar with, to style of teaching. So he takes them off in one direction. The kingdom of heaven is like, and so they're anticipating, what is he going to compare it to? And then he changes direction. It's like a mustard seed sown in a field. So he's trying to teach his disciples some new understandings about the kingdom of heaven. And so it takes them to sermon. It took them to sermon. It takes us to sermon to try to understand what is, what is Jesus trying to tell us. And if there's one lesson out of all of these parables that you might take with you today, I want you to take the lesson it takes just one. It takes just one. Now in the non-canonical Gospel of Thomas, that's a Gnostic writing, found in the Nag Hammadi Library or cache of writings found, um, that some call them the Dead Sea Scrolls. Um, there is a teaching similar to the parable of the fish that we have in our in our text today. And many think that the Gospel of Thomas, it's a Gospel of sayings of Jesus. And many think that these writings come earlier than the Gospel of Matthew and Mark. So Matthew and Mark, as they were writing the Gospel, may have had these sayings, this Gospel of Thomas, that they were reading and understanding different things that Jesus said. So I'm using it because I, I want to use the parable, it's, it's the eighth saying in the Gospel of Thomas, so I'm going to read it to you. And he said, the man is like a wise fisherman who cast his net into the sea and drew it up from the sea full of small fish. Among them, the wise fisherman found a fine large fish. He threw all the small fish back into the sea and chose the large fish without difficulty. Whoever has ears to hear, let him hear. What is Jesus saying? What is Jesus saying in the other parable of the, of, the, of the miraculous catch of fish, right? He's saying that the kingdom of heaven is like one large fish, just like the pearl of great price, right? The kingdom of heaven is like a, a merchant who is searching for pearls and he finds one big pearl and he sells all that he has to get that one big pearl, that one big pearl. Here the fisherman keeps one large good fish. Now how is the kingdom like that? You said to yourself. At least I hope that's what you say to yourself. Well, as we all know, there are many things in life that want to promise us good things that we think we can't live life without. Things that we think we should value above other things. Our discernment process requires that we learn that though many things bring us temporary joy, the one thing of great value. Jesus and his promise of eternal life is of much greater value than all of the other things that promise us something. It's a prize that we should hold above everything else. It takes just one large good fish, one thing we value, like the kingdom of God, that we value above everything else. Jesus says the kingdom of heaven is like a mustard seed. One mustard seed sown in a field. It becomes a huge tree where birds can, birds of the air can nest in its branches. How is the kingdom of God like that? In the Old Testament, the realm of God was described as a grand, tall cedar tree. So Jesus doesn't deny that teaching. He just says that the kingdom inaugurated through the Son of Man is also like an insignificant seed, something so small, yet grows into an invasive presence. 
You know, it's easy to see the kingdom of God as something grand and miraculous. Jesus says the kingdom is also, or can also be found in the smallest of things, the least likely of places, like in a hospice center, or people struggling with addictions, or people angry about pandemics, or people struggling in the depth of a housing project, people in prison, even in the church, you know, that often we become fearful, struggling people of God. So Jesus says it takes just one seed, one seed, one seed that all of the creatures of the earth can find shelter and rest and a place in the in the inbringing of the kingdom of God. Jesus also says that the kingdom of heaven has the character or is like leaven mixed into flour until yeast appears. How is the kingdom like that? Leavening, and if you're familiar with the process of leavening, but you store bread in a damp, dark place until it molds and rots and decays, and in this process, yeast appears. We can compare the parable to that of the wheat and the tares. Right? We may see someone as rotten, someone as moldy, someone as troubled, and yet there is potential for seeds of faith to grow in those people as well. The kingdom grows in places and in people we just don't expect, and often in mysterious ways. The realm of God can be hiding, it can be working, it can be growing, it can be infesting in people and in places that we just do not expect. And then he says the kingdom of heaven has the character or is like a treasure hidden in a field, which someone finds, then he hides it again, in his joy, he sells all of his possessions to buy the field and then digs up the treasure again. So how is the kingdom of God like that? We know, of course, that coveting is a sin. Wanting what we do not have so much that it consumes us or, or we obsess over it is just a toxic way of living. But perhaps the parable moves beyond that. The kingdom is to grasp us rather than us grasping for things. It grasps us so much that we are willingly, we willingly abandon everything so that we will allow the kingdom to be our only possession of value. Everything else is to be secondary. The kingdom is to grasp our thoughts, our actions, our feelings, so much that we find ourselves doing crazy and Risky and joyful and costly things that others may look at us and say, are you crazy? And you say, yeah, I'm crazy for the kingdom of God. There are many things in life that want to promise us good things that we think we can't live life without. The discernment requires us that though many little things may bring that temporary joy, there is that great value that we find in the kingdom of God. There are many small-g gods that seek our time and attention. Gods like pride, gods like envy, gods like money, like avarice, like nationalism. You know, as Lutherans, we profess and confess our belief in one God, one Lord, one faith, one baptism, one God we know as Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, who places certain demands on us, demands on our time, on our actions, our humility, our forgiveness, our love. God looks to each one of us for a response every day. Now you might say, well, why should I be the one? Why should I be the one to forgive, the one to love, the one to give in, the one to say I'm wrong, the one to say I've been selfish? Well, what I'm trying to convince you of today is that it takes just one, just one moment, one decision, one step in making our world a better place. One step towards increasing God's reign on this earth. So what can we learn from these many parables today? 
I believe what we can glean is this. First of all, each one of us matters to God. And every single action we take every day matters to God. Every single decision to love, to put others first, matters to God. Every moment we take to pray, to give thanks, to pray for others, matters to God. We believe that our one God is what unites us with all people. You might say, well, I can't believe it just takes one. Have you looked around this world? Does this look like heaven on earth? Just one act will not make a difference, you might say. Perhaps we just have to change our perception. Do you remember the magic eye posters that used to be so popular years ago? You would look at a, at a picture and it would just have a series of sailboats on it. And what you were supposed to do was relax your eyes and stare at this picture. And over time, another deeper picture would emerge underneath. Do you remember this? Am I crazy? I mean, you could say I'm crazy, but you, you don't remember this? Back in the 2000s, like the 1990s, Magic Eye? Look it up. Google it. You all know what I'm talking about. It just took a matter of changing your perception to be able to see the hidden reality. I bring that up because, though we may not see it, see life really as things might be, God continues to work in and around us, within each one of us, through each one of us. When we plant just one seed, we pray just one prayer, we do one good deed, we put one person before ourselves. Through each single Christian act, each single moment, hour by hour, day by day, week by week, year by year. Sometimes the kingdom of heaven will be so obvious to us, so present we can't help but see it. You know, when we gather as church, when we partake in the sacraments, when we do a kind deed for our neighbor, then we know the kingdom is near. It's one seed planted like a mustard seed, one treasure found, one large fish that feeds many, one tree that grows and Spread so that all can rest and shelter in its branches. So here's how I would describe the kingdom of heaven. It's hidden, but it's also revealed. It's unpredictable, it's unpredictable, but it's also just as we imagine. It's unexpected, it's expected. It's unseen, it's visible. It's small, it's huge. It's old, it's new. It's all things we might imagine. It's nothing like we could conceive. The reign of God is everywhere and nowhere. Our challenge is to remain open to the many different ways the reign of God reveals itself to us. Because the realm of heaven is going to grasp us. When we least expect it, when we finally enter into it, even now, it's open to us. It's right in front of us. But we also know it's behind us and under us, in and through us. It is always there, open and present and hidden and indiscriminate, inviting us, possessing us, grasping us. The reign of God has been breaking in on us in places we expect and in places we would never guess. Those with ears should listen. Those with eyes should see. Amen. 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 We're going to turn in our bulletin to the Apostles' Creed. Uh, I ask that you just say it quietly to yourself. You can say it quietly along with me. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, God's only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended to the dead. On the third day he rose again. He ascended into heaven. 
He is seated at the right hand of the Father, and he will come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting.
Let us pray. Almighty God, your saints were often poor, yet you made them rich in works of faith. Help us bring you gifts that reflect our gratitude for the heavenly treasures you have given us. Amen. Holy, mighty, and merciful Lord, heaven and earth are full of your glory. In great love you sent us Jesus, your Son, who reached out to heal the sick and suffering, who preached good news to the poor, and who on the cross opened his arms to all. In the night in which he was betrayed, our Lord Jesus took bread. He gave thanks, he broke it, he gave it to his disciples, saying, Take and eat. This is my body broken for you. Do this for the remembrance of me. And again, after supper, he took the cup. He gave thanks, he gave it for all to drink, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood, shed for you and for all people for the forgiveness of sins. Do this for the remembrance of me. Amen. Lord, remember us in your kingdom and teach us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil, for thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. So at this time, we take, if you have the wafer that is in your plastic sheet, you just take out the wafer. Otherwise, you take off the top piece of cellophane that gives you your wafer. We just ask that you hold it up. The body of Christ given for you. Amen. If you're wearing white, I would not suggest you hold this right over your shirt, but maybe away from you a little bit. this blessing. The body and blood of our Lord Jesus Christ strengthen you and keep you in his grace. Amen. Let us pray. O giver of every good gift, you have fed us at your table that we might abide in your love and draw our life from you. Send us forth into the world to bear the fruits of the Spirit, that all creation might be filled with the life of the risen Christ, in whose name we pray. Amen. Go forth into the world rejoicing in the power of the Holy Spirit. Blessing of Almighty God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit be with you this day and forever. Amen. Go in peace, serve the Lord. Thanks be to God. Thank you very much for coming. Thank you, Andrea, for reading the lessons and the prayers. Have a safe week out there. It's going to be a hot one today. It'll be a good day to well, now you can watch baseball. Baseball, women's soccer, maybe golf, I don't know. Stay inside, stay cool.